Hey gang, welcome to the first lecture in Module 3 entitled Mammalian Social Behavior and Communication. In this lecture, initially, I'll define the spectrum of social behaviors that we observe in mammals. Then I'll explore both the costs and benefits of living in groups. We'll think about why behavioral sociality even evolved in the first place. And then lastly, we'll survey a suite of different means by which animals communicate with one another. This is going to be a fun intellectual ride, so kick back and let's think about why these howling wolves live in packs. Social systems encompass an array of interactions between members of the same species, including interactions like mating systems and parent-offspring interactions, both of which we'll cover next week, competition and cooperation between related or unrelated individuals, which we'll explore more fully in Module 6, so big idea right off the bat. Sociality is not binary, meaning species are either social or asocial. But it's more um, appropriate to think about sociality on a spectrum, where at one end we have species that are solitary as adults, like this leopard hanging out in the tree. Other solitary species uh, as adults include bears, skunks, opossums, armadillos, pocket gophers, and the irascible rhinos. At the opposite end of the spectrum of potential social behaviors are species that always live in groups. In fact, they would be unlikely to survive away from their group. So examples include these meerkats here on the bottom right. U sociality or extreme sociality is most often observed in the order Hynoptera. This is the arthropod order that contains the bees, the wasps, and the ants. However, we do observe eusociality in two species of mammals, the African mole rats, including the uh, adorable naked mole rat pictured here, as well as the Damaraland mole rat. So according to the famous Dr. E. O. Wilson, Three traits characterize eusocial organization. Number one, cooperation among individuals in the colony in the care of young. Number two, eusociality is characterized by reproductive castes, a caste system with non-reproductive members caring for reproductive nest mates. And then number three, overlap among generations such that offspring are going to assist parents in raising siblings. So naked mole rats, they form colonies with a single reproductive active female, a queen, who's monogamous with a single breeder male. And then they're surrounded by these subordinate workers. The workers perform offspring care, they're taking care of the babies, construction and defense of the burrow system, and then those workers are securing the food supply. So why would natural selection favor group living in mammals? In 1974, Alexander wrote, there is no automatic or universal benefit from group living. Indeed, the opposite is true. There are clearly automatic and universal detriments to living in groups. Those universal costs, which I'll elaborate more on here shortly, are competition for resources, and increased transmission of parasites because you're in close proximity to your con specifics. That said, there are benefits too, or all animals would be loners. 
Most of the benefits of sociality can be related to two ecological factors. One, minimizing predation risk, and two, foraging success, like we see here. It's a bit gory, um, but this is a pic, uh, picture that's a prime example of increased foraging success. These are chimpanzees in Uganda. These chimps are far more successful when they work together, when they hunt together at catching and killing red colobus monkeys. One obvious benefit bestowed to animals living in groups is increased protection against predators. So in fact, this herd of zebras, it kind of makes me dizzy. I mean, it is clearly disorienting, and this is a still shot. Imagine if this herd of stripes was in motion. So there are several different hypotheses that have been put forth to support this idea that group living is going to increase uh, an individual's protection against predators. The first is the many eyes hypothesis, and it states that if I'm an individual living in a large group with many other sets of watchful eyes, then I don't need to spend as much time scanning my world watching for predators. And now I'm freed to do other things that are going to increase my fitness. I'm going to have more time to forage. I'm going to have more time to seek out mates. The dilution of a risk hypothesis Right here, number two is clearly exemplified uh, by these zebras, but it proposes this idea that if a predator is going to kill one animal, then being in a larger group reduces any one individual's chance of being the one that gets killed. In other words, zebras that are in the middle of this, uh, you know, uh, disorienting herd, they're relatively safe from lions. This has been coined the selfish herd effect meaning an animal's position in a group is going to reduce its exposure to predators. Individuals surrounded uh, by other individuals in the group, they would be relatively safer. It then follows that the safest place to be is in the center of the group. So an awesome anti-predator strategy employed by these musk oxen here is to surround their vulnerable young. So there's the wolves have to go through this impenetrable wall to get to those calves. Recall that an animal society is a group of individuals of the same species organized in a cooperative manner, typically extending beyond just sexual and parenting behavior. There is cultural knowledge stored in the minds of the matriarchal orca or elephant or pronghorn antelope about where to find food resources, when to migrate, which migratory routes to take, one of my old colleagues, Dr. Matt Kaufman, who's the unit leader at the Wyoming Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit up in Laramie, uh, Matt and his students put GPS collars on a large sample size of pronghorn. And it turns out that pronghorn in Wyoming, they're going to travel a 120 mile long migration, navigating treacherous oil fields like the Pinedale Anticline Gas Patch. Uh, it's an intensively drilled piece of public land in western Wyoming. They're also going to navigate tricky highway crossings, subdivisions, a, a 9,100 foot mountain pass, all to get to the Snake River in Grand Teton National Park. It's a challenging journey and not all are going to make it, but they are successful year in and year out because they're guided 
by these older does, these older females that have this stored cultural knowledge of when to leave and which routes to take. What's so astounding is that some of these routes have likely been used since the Pleistocene for thousands of years. But we are rapidly transforming the Western landscape. This pronghorn migration, one of the longest and most dramatic land animal movements in the United States is becoming increasingly perilous. Please put me on pause and take uh, one minute and 45 seconds and check out the embedded National Geographic video entitled Pronghorn Face Modern Challenges. Uh, this summarizes uh, some of Matt's work. Another tangible benefit of group living, which is especially evident for carnivores, is group living is going to provide you and your group with access to larger and more dangerous prey that you couldn't take down by yourself. So this is actually another former colleague. This is the work of Dan McNulty from Utah State University. Uh, Dan and his student Amy Tallon demonstrated that there is an optimal group size, an optimal pack size for the wolves in Yellowstone National Park. Your pack needs to be big enough to take down the largest, most energy rich prey in the park, the buffalo or bison, which can be six feet tall at the shoulder and weigh in excess of 2,000 pounds. But your pack size can't be so large that there's not enough meat to go around to everyone in the pack if you kill just a, a measly mule deer. So another point worth noting is having a group of hunters allows for more strategy in terms of how you chase and secure that prey item. It allows for a division of labor amongst the pack members or the pride members uh, of, for the carnivores. So female African lions, for example, they have this winging formation. It's a hunting approach uh, where the females are going to form these wings along the outside and they're going to keep the prey contained. We also see hunting role specialization in bottlenose dolphins in which one individual is going to drive the fish towards uh, the group uh, which has formed a barrier. They're closely spaced together and you've got one individual that pushes the fish into this wall of uh, pod mates for them to feed. So again, these strategies would not be possible if you're hunting solo. Lastly, by hunting in groups, animals like this bloody-faced cheetah here, they're going to reduce the probability that other larger animals are going to steal their food, which is called kleptoparasitism. On the African savanna, there is a lot of competition between cheetahs and lions and uh, spotted hyenas, African wild dogs. So if you have one, two, three, four, five cheetahs on a carcass, you're less likely to be pushed off of that carcass by hyenas. And speaking of hyenas, here's a great shot of an epic battle between lionesses. We've got three of them and a uh, group of spotted hyenas that really want to get at that Cape Buffalo carcass. So there's one study that's noted in your textbook that said, on average, African carnivores are forced to share their food resources with over 20 other species on the savanna. So uh, when you've made a kill, it helps to have friends to protect that kill. So this is one of my favorite topics in mammalogy. That is social learning and animal culture. 
Social learning is the process of acquiring knowledge by observation of or interaction with another individual, usually of the same species. For example, orangutans are not born with the innate knowledge that they can use leaves uh, to craft umbrellas to keep them dry on uh, rainy days and nights in Borneo. They learn this early on by watching mom do it or older siblings. If we think about certain populations of animals that have a specific suite of learned behaviors that are shared among individuals living in that social group, but that those behaviors aren't necessarily in other groups, that group-specific knowledge that's passed down from one generation to the next, that's culture. That's animal culture. So for example, another primate example, some populations of chimpanzees will fashion sticks so that they can fish for termites, whereas other chimpanzee troops don't appear to know how to do this. However, I think the best example of animal culture is the pod-specific hunting strategies employed by orcas or killer whales. So those old grandmother matriarchs that live long beyond their reproductive years, those matriarchs are very wise. They're skilled. This footage here, this is going to blow your mind. I beg of you, take the three minutes here and watch this now. It is so good. Another important benefit of group living, particularly for small-bodied animals, is thermoregulation. So huddling together to stay warm, especially if you don't hibernate during the winter. So great example of a bat colony that's packed together and they're trapping that body heat, using that body heat uh, from their colony mates. All right, all that said, there are always trade-offs in nature. There are costs that are associated with various strategies, and one large and obvious cost of group living is being forced to compete for limited resources. Limited resources like food, like mates, or shelter. If you have a large pride of lions with lots of cubs, one Thompson's gazelle is just not going to go very far. This publication, cited at the end of this lecture, is an extensive meta-analysis. A meta-analysis, of course, is a compilation and analysis of numerous published studies. This study definitively demonstrates that living in close proximity to conspecifics, living in groups, is going to increase transmission of a multitude of parasites, uh, like these really disgusting uh, deer ticks. Animals living in groups have to compete with conspecifics over limited resources, and they're swapping parasites at much higher rates. So why then does social behavior even evolve? Remember, biology only makes sense when we view it through an evolutionary lens. So sociality, like all things in biology, it's all about fitness, maximizing your reproductive success and that of your offspring. Our genes are ultimately selfish and they only want to propagate themselves. What this table is expressing is that a mutualistic behavior is beneficial to both the recipient of the behavior and the actor who does the behavior. So mutualism is plus plus beneficial for both recipient as well as actor. 
whereas an altruistic behavior benefits the recipient of the action but comes at a cost to the actor. Uh, the act itself uh, could potentially be detrimental to the bestower of the deed. Good maternal care of her infant by this chimpanzee mother is mutualistic. The baby here is clearly benefiting. It's being nourished and cared for. It's more likely to survive. But mom is benefiting as well, certainly from an evolutionary perspective, because that baby represents mom's genes. Its survival and reproductive success increases mom's evolutionary fitness. Altruistic behaviors, behaviors that cost the actor but benefit the recipient, i.e. plus minus behaviors, are a little trickier to understand, at least on the surface. So consider the famous vervet monkeys of southeastern Africa. They live in troops. When an individual vervet monkey sees an eagle or a snake or a leopard or some other threat, it's going to let out an alarm call to alert the rest of the group. But in doing so, it's going to make its own whereabouts known to that predator. It's going to call attention to itself, and that's a risk. So being snatched up and gobbled up by an African crowned eagle or a black mamba or a python is certainly detrimental to your evolutionary fitness. What's even more amazing about these vervet monkeys is that their alarm calls for different predators, eagles, snakes, leopards, and baboons, are acoustically different. They're distinct. And they respond to these distinct calls in different ways. They're going to seek cover from birds of prey. They're going to stand up and scan uh, to determine the snake's location. In this uh, BBC video embedded in Canvas, the researcher clearly demonstrates the different calls that these monkeys will use for different predators and then their appropriate response to that potential threat. Note, this is all learned behavior. Infants are going to begin observing and mimicking these calls very early on. So take uh, one minute and check out this video, please. So, risking your life by sounding the alarm call, is this an example of true altruism? Well, on the surface, yes, but when examined from an evolutionary perspective, not so much. The vervet monkeys within those troops are all closely related, i.e. they share many of the same genes. And by contributing to the groups, to the troops' survival, individuals are propagating the genes that they share with their own kin. Further, there is reciprocity in these groups, meaning perhaps today, I risk my life by calling out an eagle because I know that tomorrow you will call out an eagle that I might not see. Another example of superficially altruistic behavior are wolf uh, babysitters. So oftentimes, older siblings or aunties, they may stay back and care for the young wolf pups while mom and dad and the rest of the pack are out hunting. But in doing so, the individual caregivers are gaining parenting skills. 
that enhance their own ability to rear their own offspring someday. So learning how to babysit is actually a direct benefit to the actor. Also, helping sisters and brothers and cousins who share a percentage of the actor's genome also enhances an actor's overall evolutionary fitness. Which brings us to arguably the most important concept in this lecture, that idea of inclusive fitness. Inclusive fitness is going to think beyond just the survival and reproductive success of the individual and its offspring. That's the direct fitness, the direct component within inclusive fitness. Inclusive fitness is also going to incorporate indirect fitness. The indirect fitness is the reproductive success of one's relatives. So my brothers, my sisters, my cousins, they share my genes. Thus, from an evolutionary perspective, their success is my success. In other words, helping our relatives to survive and reproduce ultimately helps to spread shared genes. And therefore, cooperation should arise when the combined propagation of those shared genes is greater than the propagation of the genes that result uh, from individual survival and reproduction alone. These ideas were first clearly laid out by William Hamilton in 1963 in his seminal publication on kin selection theory. Hamilton is really the first person to take a genes point of view on the world. So a genes perspective. Our genes really only care about us to the, to the degree in which we can benefit that gene. In a way, the genes are just using us. They're human vessels to propagate themselves. From a genes perspective, if the individual that benefited by the altruistic act is a relative of the altruist, then they're more likely than a non-relative to be carrying that gene. Then ultimately, the frequency of that gene is going to increase in the genes of, in the gene pool. So from a genetic perspective, uh, the altruistic act is really benefiting the gene. A really nice read on the topic is Richard Dawkins' famous and popular read, The Selfish Gene, which was published the year I was born in 1976. Robert Trivers also contributed to these ideas in 1971 with his concept of reciprocal altruism. The idea that if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Individuals may cooperate and behave altruistically if there's a chance that they will be the recipients of such acts at a later time. So I've got a current events connection for you on this topic in week six, but in short, an amazing study came out in March of 2020 that shows that the world's only known blood-sucking mammal, the vampire bat, developed trust with unrelated individuals, first by grooming one another, and then eventually regurgitating blood to share with that unrelated individual. It's an act of altruism, okay? But this species has to eat at least once every three days. So what's more, blood sharing tends to be reciprocal, with bats more likely to provide a meal to a partner that has shared with them in the past. So according to Jerry Carter, a behavioral ecologist at Ohio State University, in vampire bat relationships, 
we saw that the history of interactions mattered and the social environment mattered. So great example of reciprocal altruism. We're all hungry for blood. If you regurgitate a blood meal for me today, I'm more likely to regurgitate a blood meal for you down the line when you might need it. Okay, so we'll finish this lecture by surveying means by which mammals communicate. So the social interaction that I've described thus far really rests on the ability of animals to communicate or convey information from one individual to another. Communication is going to rest on some form of a signal, something the sender uses to transmit information to the receiver. This signal could be behavioral, it could be a morphological structure, like we see here in this female gelata baboon. These are uh, bright, fluid-filled blisters that form this necklace around the females when they're in estrus, when they're ovulating communicating uh, to the males uh, that now is the appropriate time to mate. Communication can occur in an array of forms in mammals, from visual, auditory, tactile, and olfactory. So let's take a closer look at each of those forms. The primary olfactory system the sense of smell is located within the nasal cavity, which is enlarged and complex in most mammals. The dorsal or the top part of the nasal cavity is lined with olfactory epithelium that contain chemoreceptors that can detect over a thousand different volatile molecules that are going to dissolve in the mucus that covers the epithelium and create nerve impulses that are transmitted to the olfactory bulbs that are on the bottom side of each of the brain's hemispheres. The ursids or the bears are thought to have the keenest sense of smell of any animal on planet Earth. So the area inside of a bear's nose, the nasal mucosa, is over a hundred times greater than ours, resulting in just an incredible sense of smell uh, in this grizzly bear. So even bloodhounds, right? The dogs that are so famous for their sense of smell, tracking criminals, right? Um, they don't smell as well as the bears do. It's estimated that a bear's sense of smell is about seven times more powerful than that of the bloodhound. Mammals have a second chemosensory system, the vomeronasal or Jacobson's organ is located between the nasal passages and the mouth. It opens up to the roof of the mouth. While the primary olfactory system, which we covered on the last slide, is going to detect volatile molecules, meaning molecules that vaporize, the Jacobson's organ detects non-volatile chemical compounds that dissolve in liquids like urine or other bodily secretions. These secretions are composed of pheromones. Pheromones are animals' chemical messaging molecules that are released specifically to signal to conspecifics and elicit responses in other individuals. So you can tell when ungulates or felids are using their Jacobson's organ because they're going to retract that upper lip like this tiger here and what's known as the Fleeman response.
response. Here's another example of the Fleeman response, that curled upper lip exposing the Jacobson's organ, this time in a Baird's tapir. So it's catching the pheromones dissolved in droplets of urine from a conspecific. And a horse showing its Fleeman response. Pheromones are especially important in social communication amongst the mammals. They're influential in mate identification and attraction. Pheromones are used uh, for spacing mechanisms in territorial species. There are even pheromone alarm smells. Sources of these products include urine, feces, the sexual accessory glands, and a number of specialized skin glands. So if you've ever carefully observed a white-tailed buck when it's rubbing the velvet off of its antlers onto a rub tree, you may have noticed that they'll also rub uh, their forehead along the scrape. So this is purposeful. They're rubbing the secretions from these two glands, uh, the gland in the forehead and the preorbital gland. So uh, these glands are used uh, by the bucks to communicate with the females, the does. There's also a gland called the interdigital gland, which is located between the hooves on each foot. And it's going to emit secretions uh, that are going to allow individuals to determine herd identity. And then further, with every step, a deer leaves scent via this interdigital gland allowing deer to not only identify each other, uh, but they can determine how long ago a deer passed through here. When multiple deer travel the same trail at different times, they're not necessarily following uh, visual cues, they're following the scent that's left by the interdigital gland of previous deer that have walked along that trail. There's also uh, the very ripe uh, tarsal glands here. These produce a fatty oil that's going to mix with the tufts of hair and it's going to capture the urine uh, that the deer purposefully excrete and runs down their legs. Pheromones allow for the identification of an individual's sex, their reproductive status, they're also used for marking territories. For example, all hyenas will scent mark their territories by smearing grass stems with a paste that's secreted by their subcaudal scent glands or anal glands and is deposited along with feces at these latrines. Latrines are used by badgers and otters and hyenas. So all of the hyenas in the clan are going to defecate in these specific spaces, in these latrines. The substances that are associated with a species' urinary and digestive systems, they're, they're highly specialized, as you would probably imagine, but they're also going to convey just a wealth of information. <laughs> Consider your pet dog, who may very much enjoy scooting his butt along your carpeted floor. Why does he do this? Your dog is scratching his anal glands. So all dogs have a unique scent. It's a bit like a human fingerprint, only <laughs> smellier. And it's formulated inside of these anal sacs. These anal sacs or anal glands are located on either side of the anus. And the idea is when the dog defecates, the anal sphincter squeezes the anal glands, which expresses this smelly uh, blob, uh, this excretion. Uh, along with the droppings. 
So this is kind of the equivalent of uh, dog social media because that secretion then uh, gives the, um, you know, whoever cares to come along and read uh, that post, read that smell, it's going to give them a message about the dog uh, that left that feces. So again, it's sex, it's reproductive status, um, specific information about that individual. Moving on to the auditory sensory channel, mammalian hearing. Mammals have pinnae. The pinnae is the external part of the ear. Um, the pinnae are going to direct the sound waves down into the middle ear, which we've talked uh, a fair amount about the three ossicles in the mammalian middle ear. Uh, we've got some impressive uh, penne here exhibited on uh, one of my son's uh, other favorite animals, the fennec fox. So with those three ossicles, mammals are capable of detecting a surprisingly wide range of sounds. But the ability of most mammals to hear high frequency sounds, and by that I mean sounds that are greater than 10 kilohertz. So that's going to set mammals apart from other vertebrates like reptiles and amphibians who can't hear in that high frequency range. Ultrasonic vocalizations, that is to say vocalizations that have sound waves that are greater than 20 kilohertz, are produced by mammals. For example, howling wolves or echolocating bats, to which we will return and discuss in more detail when we talk about the order Chiroptera in Module 6. And then one more example of ultrasonic vocalizations are singing mice. Yep, you heard that right, singing mice. So please take just the one minute and watch this little guy just really belt it out, although we can't hear much of it. Ultrasonic vocalizations are above the range of human hearing. On the other side of the spectrum, elephants are going to produce very low frequency rumbles infrasonic sounds that are going to travel great distances on the order of several kilometers. Which brings us to this week's assignment, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute Biointeractive that walks you through the amazing research of biologist Caitlin O'Connell's experimental field work that demonstrates that elephants can sense low frequency vibrations in the ground and will behaviorally respond differently at their water hole depending upon whether they hear a high frequency alarm call or they're feeling low frequency vibrations. This is a really engaging assignment uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Visual communication is accomplished via displays which are usually defined as a subset of signals that involves structures like a swollen baboon rump or ritualized behaviors with visual components. Think about the uh, alpha male silverback gorilla thumping his chest. So interestingly, while a male mountain gorilla's hearty chest beats would seem to signal aggression, new research suggests that the behavior may actually prevent violence between these massive animals, which can top out at nearly 500 pounds. Mountain gorillas live in these tight-knit 
family groups that are led by these silverback males whose authority is constantly being challenged by other males. So by advertising visually their size, their mating status, their fighting ability, these silverbacks are signaling to would-be challengers that they better think twice before starting a ruckus. The sense of touch in mammals is activated by pressure responsive nerve cells near the surface of the skin. Further, most mammals have whiskers or vibrissae which provide that tactile sense. Touch is really important in many primate species as grooming is an important social activity that functions not only to remove ectoparasites, but it also serves as this social cement that reaffirms social bonds within the troops. Remember Triver's reciprocal altruism. If you groom me today, I'll groom you tomorrow. So before you go, I have to tell you about the most sensitive touch organ in the animal kingdom. And that is the 22 tentacled ultra sensitive snout called the tactile fovea of the star nosed mole. So this organ features more than a hundred thousand nerve endings that are packed into an area that's barely more than a centimeter in diameter. Each of the star's 22 tentacles is covered by these small dome structures called Imer's organs. The average snout has some 30,000 in total. So by way of contrast, an entire human hand contains roughly 17,000 touch fibers, which is analogous to these Imer's organs on the star nose mole's snout. But this snout is smaller than a single human fingertip. So it's got more than 30,000 on an organ the size of a fingertip compared to 17,000 on an entire human hand. So it's considerably more sensitive than our hands. As we discussed in our last module, we already know that duck-billed platypuses recognize electrical potentials in a highly directional manner, as opposed to the electric fish that can only migrate linearly to the electric source. This ability is attributed to the large number and variety of electroreceptors found on their bills. So that concludes this lecture. Some really big names in this reference list that I hope you recognize. Edward O. Wilson, Hamilton, Trivers. Okay, so those are some big names in ecology. Tune in next time when we examine the elephants, hyraxes, dugongs, and manatees. Thank you so much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed it.